Okay, welcome everyone. Um, thank you for, for joining us for today's APS webinar. Um, the title of the webinar today is Getting Involved in Public Engagement and Connecting with Your Audience. Uh, this, this webinar is part of our Engaging the Public Through Science uh, webinar series. My name is Allie Law and I am an APS Public Engagement Program Manager and I'll be helping host today's webinar. Uh, we also have Claudia Fracciola on the line. She's the head of public engagement and she will also be helping facilitate today. Um, we'll get to introducing our panelists in just a moment, um, but I wanted to do a little housekeeping first. Um, so APS webinars are brought to you as a service of the American Physical Society, connecting you with expertise of individuals who can offer insights into physics careers, education programs, and professional development um, for students, working physicists, and educators. So there we go. Um, if you are not already uh, a member, I'm going to give a quick plug for becoming an APS member. Um, APS membership gives you easy access to valuable career information and professional development resources, such as these webinars, um, and allows you to get your research out to the community and network with potential colleagues or employers at our conferences and have a greater impact um, about the issues that am, are important to you through um, the grassroots advocacy that um, APS uh, uh, engages in. Um, it can also help you connect uh, with a community of like-minded folks through participations in our forums, our divisions, and our topical groups. And so if you are not yet a member, um, we would encourage you to join today by going to APS.org slash membership. Um, I will note that students get um, free membership for their first year. So if you are a student on the line, uh, definitely check that out. Uh, so how this webinar um, will be working today um, is the first portion of the broadcast, we're going to do introductions by our panelists, um, and they're going to tell you about their experience and background um, regarding public engagement. And then we're going to turn to a discussion of some questions we have prepared, um, but then we'll be opening the floor to questions from the audience. So if you would like to um, ask a question, please type it in the Q&A panel, um, which you can access by clicking the button on the bottom of your Zoom webinar window. Um, you can submit questions anytime throughout this webinar and we will do our best to address them during the broadcast. Um, you can turn on live captioning um, by uh, pressing on or off um, in the arrow key next to line, live transcript on the bottom of your screen. Um, and you can also adjust your audio settings um, by clicking the audio settings button. Uh, a link to today's recording will be emailed to you after the event and will be made available on our webinar homepage within five business days after the broadcast. Um, and I also wanna give a heads up that after the webinar today, we'll be sending you a quick feedback survey and we would really encourage you um, to please give us feedback so we can um, continue doing the things you like and improve, uh, improve where you have some, some feedback for us to improve. Okay, um, and lastly, before we dive in, I wanted to mention um, that we do have another webinar coming up in a few weeks on August 23rd um, with the topic of addressing science misinformation. This is going to be held um, in collaboration with uh, Critica, which is a nonprofit science-based organization. And so um, if you're interested in registering, you can follow the QR code on the screen. Um, I'll also drop some links in the chat for you all um, to follow if the QR code is not, is not easy for you to access. Um, we also will encourage you to join the public engagement Slack space if you'd like to continue the conversation from today's webinar and connect with other um, members who are interested in public engage engagement. So again, you can access that by following the QR code, or I will drop um, these links into the chat for you all to access as well. So um, there we go. With that, let's dive in to our webinar um, today. So we have four um, excellent panelists uh, that are joining us. And um, we're going to go one by one to, uh, to introduce them all. Um, so I think we'll start with Roxanne 
Um, and I'm going to stop sharing my screen so she can share her screen. And we'll pass it off to Roxanne Hughes, Dr. Roxanne Hughes, um, who's coming to us from the MAG lab. All right, everyone, can you see my screen? <clears throat> Let me start from the beginning yes, here. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> All right, um, welcome everyone. So I am representing a team of people um, from the Mag Lab. We um, have actually a public affairs department who does a lot of our public outreach. Um, I have a team of folks that do outreach and education in the Center for Integrating Research and Learning at the MAG Lab. Um, and then all of our scientists also, we are kind of the consultants for them as they go out into the community or engage with folks. So um, I think we are a very unique place that has a lot of experts in this field, but that should not make you scared that you can't do it on your own. Just know that there are a number of qualified experts at APS as well as I'll give you some examples of how to connect with uh, folks in your community, um, particularly from a K through 12 education aspect, which is where um, most of my work comes from. Um, so we have a number of programs. Remember the MAG Lab is a uh, NSF funded facility. So there's a lot of folks here. This is in a, a single department um, in one uh, university. But we do um, outreach events that includes an annual open house that our public affairs team uh, runs. That open house has grown from 5,000 visitors over um, a five hour day to 10,000 visitors over a five hour day. During COVID, we transitioned it um, to a virtual platform. It did not get the kind of attendance. And I think that's probably what um, I, some of our other panelists will talk about that shift during COVID um, and how much, uh, we have missed at the MAG Lab just engaging with people in person. So we're, we're coming back to that place. Uh, but we also get uh, community organizers and schools ask us uh, for scientists to do science nights. We have demos, we have kits that um, my K through 12 outreach coordinator, Carlos Villa puts together. Um, his background is in teaching physical science. So he's able to engage and kind of tell the, walk the scientists through, here's how you can do this demo. Here's this kit. So we have demos that are the big, big, like uh, amazing, superconducting, levitating train to just um, building circuits and things like that. So um, we walk folks through what they feel comfortable doing. Um, and then we also have field trips and classroom visits. Um, for the MAG Lab, part of our mission is building the STEM workforce. And these kind of one hour to maybe a five minute interaction to a one hour event or a day event, this starts to build trust between our community and the MAG Lab and science in general um, and show parents and children and teachers what else they what else the MAG Lab has to offer. Um, and oftentimes for those, those folks that are calling in, in terms of the U.S. Uh, school system, physics isn't really differentiated out until high school. So a lot of parents and children and community members might not have ever taken a physics class. It's not required in high school. So there's sometimes a fear. There's sometimes a complete lack of even understanding what physics is, even though it's fundamental to all of these other subjects and ideas. So you are trying to build this trust of um, not appearing overly um, intellectual or above folks when they come in for these events and just showing them that it is accessible. Um, we also have uh, summer camps, which I'll cover the first two outreach events and summer camps I'll cover in this presentation. I'm happy to answer questions outside as well. And I won't go into the details of our mentoring program specifically, just because those get more into the education realm. Um, and this particular topic is, is focused on public engagement, but the summer camps are really great opportunities most communities have summer camps, after school session, community events. Um, it's just looking in the local paper or connecting with the right uh, folks in the school system or in the community. Our summer camps we run, and that just gives folks an opportunity to, our scientists, an opportunity to test out an idea, see if they're engaging um, middle school students. It's a tough age. Seeing if they're engaging those middle school students and getting them excited about STEM and interested in STEM and physics. So. 
Um, this is probably the one that's most relevant, I think, when people talk think about public engagement and science communication. Uh, we often get the local library. Um, we've had a relationship with them of a monthly science night, and we have a scientist from the Mag Lab, Yulia Smith, pictured, pictured here, who um, develops that and would um, engage oftentimes incorporating a book related to the topic. So if there's engineering, um, picking an age appropriate book, which the library helped with, um, Yulia didn't have to do all of that work on her own. Um, but libraries are an amazing place to do this because the librarians are, are a really cool resource. Um, and it's, it's a, a, an accessible space for a lot of folks that might not ever go to the university physics lab or to the mag lab, but getting out into the community um, has been really, really beneficial for us. Um, and then we've also engaged with some community efforts in some of our low income neighborhoods in Tallahassee. Um, again, a really cool opportunity having, you don't have to be the one as the scientist to engage that. It's to potentially like going to um, an outreach event at your university or an event in your community and meeting the players um, and the gatekeepers for those spaces. And our community organizers in town um, will reach out to us and say like, we need a scientist for this and we can like absolutely partner them with. A lot of our um, faculty have already done that work um, because they serve on boards, even for um, housing communities and things like that. So uh, there's a lot of ways in which to get involved in the community. And then we have our field trips too, where we bring folks to the mag lab. And sometimes we have scientists that are like, I don't know if I can do a tour. We do a tour guide training and we also have a booklet for that. But there are a number of ways to um, engage students and the public and I think the best advice that I could give is don't be afraid about not getting it right on your first try, like being willing to go out there and attempt to do it and then be willing to get the feedback. Um, and as long as you show excitement for what you're talking about, even if it's over folks heads, they will be engaged and they will be willing to share like here's how that could have made more sense or you can even tell from the questions that they ask so when folks pose questions, listen to that to figure out how to engage in those activities um, and know that if you are at a university, there's um, departments that can help you to translate that information too. If you have an idea, colleges of education on university campuses are great places to do that, to see like, how could I translate this to a general um, public audience? Um, so then the second piece, just to highlight, um, the aspect for our summer camps, trying out a lesson or an activity with an after school program. Um, super, usually it's a smaller group, or um, you know, universities and communities will do large scale events, but you typically aren't working with a thousand people at one time. You might have like 20 come in and do the activity with you. Uh, those are a really great opportunity to fine tune. Um, an idea that you have or an activity that you have because you're just doing it either over and over again or you're getting that real time feedback from the public or the children that you're engaging. And again, if you do it at an, like an all day event, you can't even start to you, you can't even spend too much time like being like, wow, I really messed up because you're just moving so fast. So by the end, you're exhausted, but you probably learned a lot about what worked and what didn't work in that activity. Um, so I highly recommend trying out activities in um, an all day event or a program like a summer camp or an after school program, Boys and Girls Club, um, 4-H, a number of these Girl Scouts, Boy Scouts, they're always looking for scientists for this and they're in every community. And that you will have the added aspect of having an expert, whether it's a teacher or someone who works in that after school setting, to give you some feedback of how you could do it or you could see how they interact with the students as well um, and get their feedback on what you're doing. So I will end there with my slides and just say before I pass it on that it's always like there's probably never you're never going to be at the expert level that you want to be to engage with the public, but that's okay. It's more about kind of it's more about the engagement, like showing the excitement that you have for your science. Um, and interacting with the community. And for some folks who are new at a university or in a, a town, this is probably the best way to get to know people in your community and town and engage with them. Um, so without 
Um, Ali, I'll, I'll turn it over to you to go to the next panelist. Yeah. Thank you so much for that, Roxanne. And I think we're um, gonna dig into some of the suggestions that you had um, when we get to the discussion in a moment. But um, next, I think I'll pass it um, to Chelsea, uh, Chelsea Hendris, who is joining us today uh, very graciously um, during her move from, <laughs> from Michigan to Ohio. Um, so I'm gonna let Chelsea tell you a little bit about herself and her background. Hi, everybody. Uh, can you hear me all right? Yes, we can hear you. Great. Um, so I'm Chelsea. I am finishing up my PhD at the University of Michigan, but I'm also uh, starting imminently as a lecturer at Ohio State. Um, and outreach is one of my absolute like passions. Public engagement is one of my favorite things in the whole world. Um, so much so that alongside my degree, I also have a certificate in museum studies um, because that's one of the places that I really see a lot of cool science happening. Um, and there's a lot of really cool stuff going on to engage the public and talk about science in the media. Um, I want to echo a lot of the stuff that Roxanne said about um, how these are great places to start to find your community and find places that you want to present um, your research and stuff. Um, a couple of things that I've found interesting really recently when it comes to like research and stuff that I've been looking into. Um, I have a couple of acquaintances at COSI, the Columbus Center for Science and Industry, which is a large science museum here in Columbus. Um, and we were having a discussion the other day on um, the improvement that comes from presenting your outreach education stuff, even if it's just to talk about your research with more than one person. Um, so if you bring a friend along, whether that's a lab mate or uh, another grad student or somebody in your department that doesn't do what you do, um, having two people up in front of an audience that can play off of each other and kind of explain things and like, and jump in and answer questions um, has been shown in some ways. This is a pilot study that COSI is doing. Um, there are some indicators that that does actually significantly improve like guest engagement as well and the way that people uh, receive what you're talking about, which is really cool. Um, I really like bringing science to places where people expect it the least. So. One of the, my favorite outreach activities that I've organized was at a craft show. Um, it's local to Akron, Ohio, but they, they were already doing this craft show that had a lot of like nerdy buy-in. So there were lots of like Star Trek, Star Wars themed things there. Um, and I was walking around and they had an entertainment booth and it was just a guy playing a guitar at the time. Um, but I happened to meet him and I said, you know what you guys need is, is a science booth. And they were like, oh, would you guys come and, and do some science for us. And so we brought down some demos, like uh, a laser. Um, we had a little interferometer that we put together that you could you know, uh, broadcast stuff on a screen um, and just a couple little accessible things. We did a really excellent demonstration about uh, finding the Higgs boson with a pinata and some martial arts equipment um, that culminated in like a three-year-old beating a pinata with a very large stick. Um, to explain how increasing the energy input uh, into a particle collider helps us break particles apart and see what's inside, um, which was really, which is really fabulous and very much like one of the highlights of my engagement career, uh, having the folks that ran Oddmall come up to us afterwards and say, that was the coolest thing we've ever seen. Can you come back? Um, and so all of that kind of stuff is stuff that I really love. And I would love to see people be creative about the places that they go when they do engagement activities. Awesome, thanks for that introduction, Chelsea. And I think that actually um, is a great transition into our next speaker, uh, Dena Uzadi, uh, because Dena, I think has also done some work bringing physics into um, unexpected places. So I'll, I'll pass it to Dena. Thank you. Yeah, hi everyone. Let me just pull up my slides. I'm gonna also share a link to my slides in the chat for people to possibly see enough material to ask questions uh, because I intentionally created the slides that are longer than five minutes. And I knew that I'm not gonna talk about all of them. So let's see if I can, okay. Is it shared to everyone? Um, I'll, I'll drop it to everyone. I, I Okay, great. I put it in the chat, hopefully. And then I'm going to share my screen. Okay. 
Okay, can you see my screen well? Yes, you can see it. Perfect. Uh, let's see. Okay. Uh, so thank you so much again for having me. Uh, I will start by telling a little bit about, oh, oops, myself. Uh, I am a physics education researcher. Uh, and I'm also a research consultant doing similar physics education research stuff. I do have a PhD in experimental biophysics, um, so I shifted towards physics education right after my graduation, which was in 2018, as a postdoc. Um, I'm, I've been also a practitioner for years now, and I do a lot of hobby art myself. Um, my email address is down there, so please feel free to ask any questions uh, about any of that. Uh, so some of the experiences that might relate to uh, the panel today is like my postdoc experience for the last almost four years is uh, one of them, the main one, which was I was the lead, for, uh, I should say, uh, researcher was uh, understanding and characterizing the landscape of informal physics education or physics public engagement across the nation and beyond. And also um, part of or small part of that project turned into the challenges of COVID era, which is also published. And then we started creating a key components model that we think it's the first step towards creating tools for practitioners to actually self uh, evaluate their own programs. Um, the second um, thing that I've been focusing on over the years was doing uh, or creating and designing hybrid spaces that actually blend physics with art, which both had been my passion. And as a research consultant, I started working with practitioners who needed some evaluation or research on their programs. And uh, since they were also in formal spaces, I thought that could be relevant to the talk today. The last part is uh, my new job since July, which is like more formal education. So I'm not gonna talk about that. Um, so the two things that I'll focus on today is my experience as a practitioner and also as a research consultant. So here's a list of selected stuff that I've done over the last, um, during my postdoc basically over the last four years, um, considering the fact that pandemic has um, ruined a lot of things for a lot of informal programs. Most of the things, as you see, since 2018 or 2019 towards like 2020 and then 2020, some of the stuff that we wanted to do in person turned to be uh, actual virtual stuff. Uh, and then 2021 and 2022, and again, back at it doing some more stuff. So I've listed because I'm a visual person and um, I've listed things uh, in this list that you just saw in um, small pieces, like explaining my role, explaining the actual uh, event, and also like pieces of uh, screenshots of the things we have done. For example, this is a website that we actually designed for Science Gallery Detroit rather than doing an in-person per in physical exhibition because of the pandemic. Uh, and then this is one of the events that I organized, uh, which was called Schrodinger's Cat is in Town. We did two series, two and one, so I'm going by the year. So this is 2020, right before the pandemic hit. And um, this is another one, which was in 2019. Unfortunately, these two were the only ones we were able to do with the uh, MSU Abroad Art Lab. And then um, this is like an example of the pre-post survey. Uh, I appreciate it that uh, Roxanne also talked about it a little bit, um, uh, the way we had collected information from the people who joined, also caring about if they're return attendees and uh, how they relate themselves with physics in general. So we wanted to really know if they actually are physicists or not and uh, what has attracted them to this event because this was a combination of physicists and artists and we were hoping that the artists can break that into intimidated version of the physics that we initially have in the departments and make it more fun for people and this is another example of a physics with art that i uh, co-organized in our department during the summer of 2019 again unfortunately that was the last one we did um and then um i also um applied for a booth in one of our local art festivals back in 2019. And um, I was lucky to get a booth um, as a physicist slash artist there. Uh, we had this art and physics corner that had like a small table for kids to actually do spin art. And also I was selling my own um, physics theme uh, created art for the audience. 
Uh, as I said, I'm happy to answer questions on any of that. These are some of the volunteer works that I've done with my colleagues at MSU. Um, but since they were not the center of, uh, I wasn't basically designing or creating them. I'm just like going to go through them a little bit. I was also the panelist for the um, Physics Education Research Conference of Blending Physics and Other Interests, which we talked about dance and sports and art. And I was just um, focused on the art part. Um, for the research consultant project, uh, I actually have presented that in the Physics Education Research Conference this year. So I thought it would be easier if I just like put a QR code here for people to um, check the paper we have uh, submitted, which is going to be published in next month or so. And also the poster I had, um, I'm happy to answer any questions, but for the sake of time, I'm going to stop here and let you go through my slides if you have more questions. Thank you, Dana. Um, and last but not least, I think we'll pass to um, Eva Costadinova to uh, tell us about her background. Sure. Hi, everyone. Um, let me find the slides. Well, we'll see. Not this. I'm preparing syllabus for the math class. But hi, uh, thanks so much for having me. I'm Eva Kostadinova, and I'll just briefly tell you about me um, and my science and how the science I do requires a lot of uh, public engagement that currently lacking. So uh, this is me. I'm currently assistant professor at Auburn. I did my PhD at Baylor in uh, 2017, so pretty recently. And I focus my work on transport problems and disordered matter uh, with non-local interactions, which sounds like you know a bunch of fancy words, but um, essentially a lot of the work I, I've done is interdisciplinary between math and physics, which requires a lot of communication, even just to do your work, uh, I had to learn how to practice communicating very sophisticated ideas to colleagues who are not from the same field, which was, kind of my first real attempt at communication, which doesn't come naturally, but had to be learned. Um, and on another side of things, um, I'm a female international student. Uh, well, I was a student, I came from Bulgaria. So um, I did my bachelor's in a small liberal arts school, Furman University in Greenville, South Carolina. So uh, there was a lot of this kind of like, you know, feeling that, and I'm not sure if I'm right for science. I don't know if I'm going to fit in, if I'm going to be as good as everybody else. And, and again, uh, communicating your ideas uh, became really important in that sense to, to fit in and career wise. Uh, this photo on the right is me and my sister dressed up as the butterfly effect, which is one form of, of really communicating your ideas to, I don't know, a bar, a bar in down, downtown Chicago. But basically, um, it was in the year where the um, Nobel Prize for Physics was given for uh, develop, uh, development of chaos theories. So, and the butterfly effect basically says that the flapping of a, of a butterfly on one part of the world can cause a hurricane in another part because uh, climate is a very complex interrelated system. So that was, here is one type of uh, um, published engagement that went really well. Um, best Halloween costume ever. We could never repeat a better, a better version of this. Uh, but the, the scientific work I'm doing, again, is lies at the intersection of a lot of in, a different um, fields. Um, and I've just briefly listed the directions of the topics I work on, which are rather, um, rather dispersed. Um, so in one project, we study how um, origin of life started in, on Earth. So at the, the very basic step of how inorganic molecules uh, spontaneously started forming organic molecules that are building blocks of life. And then in another project, we study how, um, how to protect Earth uh, from, from space weather. So when the sun has gigantic eruptions of plasma, uh, they interact with the Earth's magnetic field and that causes all sorts of 
uh, problems with communication and GPS and satellites and, and safety of astronauts. So we tried to study how this, this, these plasmas are transported in different magnetic fields um, and prevent from, from this uh, damage to happen. Um, and yet in another project, they studied very fundamental physics of what happens to the laws of physics when you remove gravity. So for this, we have an experiment that we work with for uh, on the International Space Station, which uh, where we, we study how particles self-organize and move around uh, in the absence of gravity. And we're trying to redefine fundamental principles of chaos and self-organization stability in the absence of gravity. Um, and then another project, yet another project, we study how um, heat shields are for spacecrafts burn when they enter at very high speeds, very thick atmospheres, such as those uh, of the gas giants. Now, all of these projects, as, as diverse as they sound, all of them uh, lie under the topic of plasma science and engineering. And so I'm a plasma physicist, and I like to say I'm an interfacial plasma, interfacial physicists or interfacial scientists, because one, all the topics I work on lag the intersection of multiple disciplines, two, literally they are at the intersection of plasma interacting with a, with a different kind of matter. And plasma is the fourth state of matter is something that uh, probably you've heard of like once at school where the, 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 the states of matter were listed and that's it, yet you see all sorts of applications currently are enabled. So, and I, I haven't even listed some of the big ones, like the, the electronics is powered by plasma processing. So, you know, the cell phone is possible because of plasma. Um, the future of energetics, we think will be a nuclear fusion, which will be essentially carbon free um, and an almost limited source of, of energy for the world, which a lot of colleagues are currently working on. This is also plasma. And then again, all of these topics of space exploration, origins of life, future of life are all uh, related to the science of how pl this plasma state of matter works and interacts with the other states of matter. It's a huge problem though, to communicate this to the, to, um, the people. And when I say people, we're not talking only K through 12, the issue that plasma is not even mentioned as a word. Uh, it's also not mentioned in NASA, um, in, in NASA's public events. So for example, you've probably heard of the James Webb uh, telescope, which is like, the latest big deal, um, and it's really a huge deal. It's it's substituted the Hubble telescope, and it's all of these amazing photos of the universe. The best ones that we've ever had so far come from this telescope. Every single press release is showing one way or another a photograph of a plasma, because 99.99% of all of the visible universe is in a plasma state. Yet the word plasma is not even used. Instead, they'll say something like an ionized gas. And we're just yelling at the TV every time, every plasma business is, this is a plasma. Why can we not say that? Um, so even fellow scientists oftentimes don't know how important uh, for, for society and fundamental science plasma is, um, but also lawmakers, politicians. So as I said, this thing has a huge application in energetics. The whole department of energy has a huge budget to fund fusion energy, yet, the public doesn't know what this is, and it's it seems like something you know scary and unknown, and and who knows what. So, actually, I would say the kind of the difference between, well, probably the difference in what I'm doing in terms of public engagement is that a lot of what I'm trying to do is um, field specific, and it's because as you as you may have heard, there is a ton of amazing work done in STEM. Yet, when I look at the statistics, let's say APS, APS has a division of plasma physics. Well, physics in general has the worst statistics of diversity and inclusion, I think, out of all the sciences. Um, well, if you count astrophysics within physics, but within the subfields of physics, um, and APS, the division of plasma physics has the worst statistics on diversity and inclusion out of all the divisions. So, 
in our sense, not only we have the need to engage the public, but we also feel like, okay, we do all of these STEM activities, but how do we how do we engage, how do we improve the status of our sub-community? And how do we use, we don't invent the wheel, but how do we use all these techniques into a topic specific um, engagement? And so just to, in a nutshell, uh, I, I've just listed some of the organizations I'm, I'm uh, involved in without going into specific examples. I think in the, in the discussion portion of this event, we can, uh, I can definitely give specific examples of activities we've done, but um, I started as a student going and giving talks to schools about plasmas, but then eventually with time, I was looking for ways to be, to invest similar amount of time and have more impact of what I'm doing. So I started being involved in organizations that manage the people who do these things. And I found out one of the most powerful things was to just really know who are the other people who do this, uh, just build networks of, of uh, practitioners who uh, um, work in STEM education or who are plasma scientists like me who do out of out age activities or um, some people who do projects with K-12 or teachers directly. So we, we're trying to build community of people who know each other share their data and information and strategies uh, so we don't reinvent the wheel but we maximize impact so uh, and i've listed here some of the the websites of the organizations i'm directly involved in uh, the plasma now is a network for outreach and workforce uh, this website is very useful for um, aspiring colleagues but also for the general public because it includes um, two pagers, which are simple explanations of things that you may know, uh, but the explanation of how this is a plasma. So for example, um, explaining why lightning is a plasma, why fire and in what circumstances fire is a plasma, um, explaining the aurora or the, the northern lights, those are other plasmas as well, plasma and technology, all these things that I talk about explained in accessible way we do this primarily for k-12 teachers but in general like I've, I've personally looked up these two pages even before i was part of this organization just to um just to explain to students sometimes when they ask me a topic that's slightly not my field then i um i i don't want to misinterpret what what is really uh, i should say um so well so this is plasma now coalition for plasma science so the two organizations that do this kind of built information for um, the general public. Um, the Fusion Power Associates is another organization which is focused on this application of plasma, which is uh, fusion energy. Um, and basically these people, they aim to bring fusion energy as a commercialized viable source of en energetics uh, in the US and in the world. Um, so they have these direct ties with industry and national labs and international communities. Um, so, um, and then from there, our plasma community is actually in, currently in the process of building networks. Um, so uh, Magnet US is a network of um, people who are interested in the, in the science of magnetized plasma, so plasma in magnetic fields. LaserNet is a similar idea of a, of a network of people who work in um, plasma, plasma with laser interactions. So laser interactions with materials that produce plasmas. Um, and then um, of course, I'm heavily involved in APS because APS has this um, you know, variety of, of, of groups and divisional um, committees and subcommittees where I can, I can really do service uh, directly uh, interacting with my community. Um, the final thing I would say about the networks is that uh, because we have the, the need to communicate these things and we have this emergence of networks, uh, we also have oftentimes collaborative grants uh, among multiple institutions because plasma, again, are, plasma topics are very multidisciplinary. So it's actually not only advisory, but necessary to do effective plasma research, to work with somebody who is outside of your field. Uh, maybe I'm doing fundamental work, they're doing the application, we have to work together. So oftentimes there are these big collaborations um, and these big grants over many institutions 
to these kind of collaborations and networks, um, we have a growing need of outreach people. Uh, and the word outreach, we're probably gonna touch based on that. It's not a great word, but public engagement people, science education people, who come and do professionally what we are trying to do, not very professionally. So I, I noticed there was a question about finding jobs. I would say, look into these things. There is a, or contact me. There is a need for, for um, people to be heading over um, field specific public engagement, there, but there is usually not a requirement that you have a degree in plasma science to do this. Uh, on the contrary, it's more, we as scientists can supply a lot of the information, but we really want somebody to come with their um, with their expertise uh, in in their with the tools and and assessment and and you know the research and STEM education and just work with us to make it you know focused on a certain topic or a certain collaboration. So with this, I think that's that's all I have. And um, yeah, thank you for you for your attention. Uh, Feel free to, to reach out to me, any questions. Thank you, Eva. Um, so yeah, I think now we'll dive into some questions. Um, so I wanted to remind um, you all that if you do have a question, you can um, type it into the Q&A panel, which you'll find on the bottom part of your Zoom uh, screen. So please feel free um, to put questions in there and we will um, try to get to as many as we can during our discussion. Um, and so I wanted to maybe uh, circle back to the one that Eva had mentioned. So there's a question in the in the Q&A right now about um, advice that you all might have on finding paid jobs or opportunities to do public engagement um, because uh, it can be hard to find uh, those, those paid opportunities. Uh, so I was wondering if any of our panelists had, um, had suggestions uh, for, for this, um, for this uh, question. I can speak to that a little bit. Um, I was just on the job market uh, this summer here and was looking for different kinds of positions. And I knew that uh, public engagement was something that I really wanted to do. I was specifically looking for um, like program management opportunities at science museums. Um, but this field kind of requires a little bit of flexibility. Um, so if you can kind of broaden what you're thinking about when you're thinking about engagement um, to in compass both like community things and university things um, and keeping an eye out for all of the different institutions and acronyms that some of these other panelists have mentioned. Um, there are a lot of places that are looking for these types of roles, um, but making sure that you cast a wide net and think about all of the different kinds of experiences that you want to have in addition to like how your research plays into things. Um, I'm kind of primarily interested in not communicating about my research specifically, but uh, science and physics more broadly. Um, so somebody had also suggested to me looking at um, all of our sister organizations, um, the American Chemical Society, other large funding corporations and stuff like that will all have outreach positions as well. Um, so it kind of requires getting creative and looking for uh, things you might not have expected. But once you get into the network of like finding these jobs, a lot of your search engines will also start to kind of send you things like, are you interested in these other positions um, that I found really helpful when I was looking for jobs? Thanks, Chelsea. Um, I wonder, Roxanne, since you are you you are uh, paid to do <laughs> to do this uh, work, um, and you have experience with kind of national lab research labs, et cetera. If you um, wanted to maybe say a few words about the types of opportunities at um, centers like your own, sure. So I think um, Eva and Chelsea gave some really good advice. There's also some organizations. Um, Aztec is the um, acronym for it, but it's the Association of Zoos aquariums and science centers. Uh, I've got those interchanged, but that that's an organization. And if you join their listserv, you will get updates on positions available at museums, aquariums, and zoos. Um, the other uh, 
the other piece, so if you're working at a, if you get a job at a university, let's say, oftentimes people don't know what they need. Um, so you might not get paid immediately, but if you start doing some of this work, you will find people in the community and you might have to create a position that needs to happen. But in terms of higher ed, I often see like higher ed doesn't know that they need an outreach person, but then if you as a scientist start doing it, they start to realize the value that it brings and you're doing some evaluation of it and showing like how this is connected and then you can make a case for that position. Um, but in terms of in terms of like positions where out the gate you can get paid, um, I would say Aztec's a great resource to look for those kinds of opportunities. Uh, the pay is not as good in um, the outreach education world as it is in the um, physics faculty world. I will say that. So that's also something to um, consider. Um, but most universities have, especially in physics departments, they have folks that are doing like if there's a planetarium, if there are like a number of of those pieces. But I honestly think that Dina might have the best because Dina kind of created, looking at her um, experience, she kind of created those positions and showed people what they needed. Um, they didn't know what they needed until they saw what she could offer. <laughs> Um, yeah, Dana, do you want to speak a little bit to that, your experience? Um, with yeah, definitely. So I would say that if you are not looking for a full-time position, then your life might be easier, like finding hourly paid jobs in the science museums or like um, different types of things like that would be easier. For me, things were easier because I was getting paid as a postdoc to do research on informal physics or physics education, uh, sorry, the physics um, outreach as uh, most of the people call it or public engagement, but the word that we use now is informal physics, which we think is broader. Um, uh, so it was easier for me because I was doing um my own job uh, as a researcher on that and then uh, part of my job was interviewing and surveying the program leaders in different states doing that so uh while i was doing that i learned a lot from the practitioners and i also started doing things uh on my own but you're right i've heard that a lot that finding paid full paid full-time at least paid jobs is harder so if you can have like something some other job as your full-time job and then do this on like as an hourly paid job or a side project for the start um, as also Roxanne said later on people will value you or value your work and know that oh we didn't have this but now that we have it we can see how much impact is having um but yeah, I've been hearing that from my colleagues too, that finding full-time good pay jobs is harder, to be honest. Go ahead, Claudia. Yeah, I just wanted to add, like, there is a growing number, however, of positions available. Like, more and more, the science community is understanding the value of this. So, for example, if you're a graduate student, the AAAS has an amazing media fellowship that it's 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 a really good place to start to set you on that career um and they also offer um many different certifications all of that helps um within higher ed institutions like yeah everyone has mentioned their their labs but also their stem centers within the high ed institutions that normally have positions related to that. Sometimes uh, there's a lot of places for science communication um, that you can look into. Uh, and there's many like freelance positions for that, that you can start as a grad student so that once you finish out your, your PhD, you know, you, you have more networks and connections. But on that note, uh, uh, we are helping build a network of people that work on the spaces of public engagement and informal physics science uh, so there, that we want to help you find those connections and Ali will be able to speak more about that. 
Um, yes, I will. And I can um, drop some information in the chat about that. Um, I guess one other thing I will say to this question um, is, uh, and this echoes kind of what, what everybody else has said, but um, National labs, uh, NSF science and technology centers, any NSF grant, but um, some non NSF funded grants as well. So DOE or other funding agencies often have a broader impacts uh, section in which people at least are supposed to <laughs> um, say how they will um, have some, you know, impact outside of their 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 research team um, for the work that they're doing. Um, and so for the bigger centers, um, those are, there are usually paid, you know, roles available for someone who's going to for this multi million dollar center direct some of the engagement work. So that would be um, another avenue that I would explore in terms of looking looking into funding agencies and big centers that they have recently funded. Um, there's probably going to be an engagement role at those locations. Um, yes, I just wanted to iterate on, on that point because I, I'm engaged in one of these centers right now. Um, you really don't have to have the scientific background for the specific topic of the grant. Uh, and specifically, look at, for example, EPSCOR, NSF EPSCOR. There's a NASA EPSCOR and DOE EPSCOR grants. Those are grants that aim to put um, well, to increase government funding in states that lack enough government funding for science and research and technology. So there are some thresholds. Um, and since I'm in Alabama, Alabama is a state. Um, these programs, while let's say our EBSCO grant is very, it's uh, shared among nine um, universities in one industry. So it's a very big grant, uh, over $20 million. Um, it's focused on plasma technology, but the a huge portion is maybe the very the most important portions of this grant is that it has to actually demonstrate impact on the workforce development. So so it's no joke, you know. It's people are not. I mean, people are really have to demonstrate in these grants some outcome um, instead of just reporting. Oh, well, with this, we did this and these activities, and it was very nice. But they'll really have to assess and uh, and argue that they made a difference at the state level. So there, I can't tell you enough, stress enough how much we need the expertise of, of, of people who do this professionally. And don't worry about not, you know, knowing plasma science. That that this is this is the part that the scientists can do, but the other part, the assessment and, and the STEM and the approach is really important. So yeah, don't shy away from topical things, but just because you're not that major. Thank you, Eva. Um, so I know it looks like uh, there, um, thank you to our panelists who have been who doing some uh, chat-based answers to some questions. So um, there was a question about, um, lists or kind of uh, places where we can find public engagement opportunities um, if they're centralized lists. So Roxanne, I think, added to the chat um, the link to uh, informalscience.org. Um, as Claudia mentioned, um, stay tuned for the fall. APS is also working on doing um, uh, having a more physics-specific resource developed, um, and I will uh, I think after today's webinar, I can follow up with you all. Um, we're in the process of actually planning our, our fall activities for this. Um, and so I can send that um, around to you all, but this will include, um, we hope, uh, an avenue for people to share opportunities that they come across or that they're leading. Um, I think, let's see. So we should also jump to, I'll just voice another question that was in the chat here um, for people who um, are not following along. Um, so uh, ideas for how to keep, um, does the panel have ideas on how to keep programs, public engagement programs or activities sustainable? Um, the pandemic obviously has had, a, a, you know, been a big challenge for um, keeping up uh, funding and support for some of this work. Um, and so does anybody have any um, advice for um, helping sustain public engagement work if you if you are involved in that? And I know um, Dana maybe 
um, you had put had put a uh, an article in in the Q and A to answer that. But do you want to speak to that a little bit more? Yeah, sure. Um, so that article is what the study that we did last year on the effects of COVID nineteen on some of the informal physics program activities in physics specifically. We interviewed fifteen different program uh, leaders and asked them during the pandemic, uh, "What is going on with you? Is your activities uh, actually being running, or is it something that you have been like uh, paused? Have you had laid off?" A lot of different questions because some of them had been interviewed initially for our um, landscape project, which was the other project that we talked about, uh, that we talked about, it was easier to do follow-ups in shorter time and get some information from them. So yes, um, lack of support for public engagement is real. Let's just all acknowledge that. I think uh, one of the things that uh, the program leaders are doing is like the heavy lifting of doing all pieces mostly. Um, I've had a lot of faculty members or other staff members who are doing things on their own. This was even before COVID and COVID had made that even worse. And uh, so to, from our study, we figured that the um, programs that had institutional support or more um, sustainable or systemic uh, institutional support were able to move forward um, better in general. Um, but yeah, so what should we do then if I'm running a program, if I'm a practitioner, uh, what should I do about it? I think this is a fight we should just keep fighting for uh, so that uh, we can make, we all physicists are all the, geek, the gatekeepers of the physics for the public. So I should say that this is our responsibility to make this happen one way or another. So if you think that your department is not supportive, if you can at least like get a number of people who can help you make this happen, if you can find donations, if you can find ways to apply for small grants through, through APS or other places, or if you know researchers um, or people who are doing this and you want to get their help, just do it on your, on your own. Unfortunately, uh, I should say that um, uh, this is the best way to show that this matters to the universities um, and also like because the pandemic has focused a lot of the energies of the institutions on the things that they wanted to sustain in the formal spaces, which means classrooms uh, and all this stuff related to that. Uh, sometimes it's not just um, intentional. They just don't remember the fact that uh, public engagement has been going on and it's been the center of a lot of things in their universities. So just like talk to your chairperson, talk to your leaders in the department and try to get as much attention as you can back. But uh, I agree that um, it's a work in progress and we're all part of this. And as much passion we have, we have to put into this to make it happen. Yeah, I was going to, Dana um, <clears throat> hit right on it, get get um, colleagues, like create a network. So it's not just you as the only person. Um, and as you build that network of folks, then it's easier if one of you can't, like if, if you're doing like a science night every month at a local library, it's good to have some other folks that are willing to do that. That makes it sustainable without the funding. It's voluntary at that point. But what will happen is the more you engage in science night, in science salons, um, science cafes, you will meet people that are like, I want to, I want to put you in front of this group, or I want to connect you with these folks. And I think um, Eva made a really good point too, of there are a number of places that need these, MERSEX, the um, other locations that need the broader impacts piece. You have to meet those people. And that happens at conferences. That happens at um, whether it's APS, whether it's it's FOP, whether it's um, the materials research sciences um, conferences, you will meet like-minded folks and you can go to the education and the outreach and public engagement sessions. And that's where someone will be like, I just lost my, my um, outreach person or they, they graduated because they had hired a graduate student. Um, so those are the opportunities to make it sustainable and to find out about funding is to utilize those networks. Um, and then I saw Ryan's question because I think it's related 
is if you want to convince um, folks in higher ed or your organization data, we're talking about scientists. So collecting data on the impact of your programs, everyone in their slides showed you some evidence of what they're doing and that list of how many new people showed up, how many, whatever the metrics are. And there, I'm, I'm happy to answer any of those questions if folks have those. But if you can present data as to what would what would speak to and it's unique to each institution. What would speak to the person that holds the the purse strings um, that can convince them that data could convince them that they need a person. And it might not be in higher ed, and and I, I like for labs. It might not be full time immediately. It might be half of your time could be spent on that, and then you get to work more on on doing that and and getting that but the data speaks so much. So starting out the program and showing them how valuable it was. Um, and sometimes even the data might not speak to it, but just showing them, like if you have an event, like showing them how many people and the faces that can warm even the coldest, like data, data, like quantitative um, driven person, um, which is also really powerful. Um, I just want to follow up on that. Uh, just the, the data portion of, what, what Roxanne was saying is that I have noticed this, unfortunately there is a bias against uh, people who do uh, public engagement as if it's not um, research backed up or it's, uh, rigorous enough, especially when you go to do some, to do some such work for national lab or for a, uh, a department at a university. Um, and I, I speak, I don't have that much experience, but I've heard these comments. Um, I've heard the positive comments about the people we've hired before to be related to, oh, they presented some, some data and some, so this is rigorous research. It is a way to really, uh, as Roxanne said, even if the data itself is incomplete or, you know, you doing research is the same as anybody else doing research. Out of one study, you can't 100% sure in, you know, I'll go, 100% this direction, that direction, but demonstrating the scientific methods, it's, it seems to be key to, to kind of win some of, some of the people who are just, uh, you know, unfamiliar with what you do. Um, I'll also add, and this was put um, in the chat both by Claudia and myself, um, a link to uh, archive where there is a white paper that was written by the committee on informing the public here at APS um, last year. Uh, that was advocate the paper itself um, advocates for the consideration of public engagement work and career advancement decisions. Um, they wrote this white paper to accompany a uh, draft policy statement um, that is being is under consideration at APS right now, um, which would would advocate for for for, um, for uh, considering public engagement uh, in career advancement decisions, uh, just like teaching and research and service uh, nominally are, are considered in those advancement decisions. So um, I, I mentioned this because not just because of the, uh, the, the advocacy, which I think um, I can, we can say APS is seriously considering adopting a statement such as this. Um, it's under consideration now, so stay tuned, but also because of the um, the research that is cited in that paper, uh, I think is a really good um, brief overview of the many different reasons why someone would want to support public engagement work. Um, and I think often, you know, we often people, physicists will think, oh, well, the public engagement work, it's only serving the community, right? It's not doing anything for, for me or for my department. Um, that's really not the case. Um, there are many benefits to doing public engagement for um, the organization who is sponsoring it, so the physics department, the lab, et cetera, um, as well as the facilitators, the people who are actually doing the engagement work. Um, so there's many reasons to, to, uh, to be engaging in it, um, and I would direct you to that paper to get kind of a brief overview of some of the research that supports, um, supports all of the different uh, benefits of, of engaging the public. Ali, I had one other, um, I'm not sure if these are in any of those, but some of that research could be on the scientists who are participating. So there is some research that shows if you are um, a faculty member or if you're teaching undergraduates, engaging gra undergraduates in this and graduate students in these activities, then you could talk to and survey the undergraduates and the graduate students. And there's research that supports 
that folks who engage in public engagement, it's too many times using engagement, but folks who are participating in that, it strengthens their sense of belonging, it strengthens their motivation to want to persist because it takes them into a space where they get to be excited about the science and to, de to demonstrate that. So even if it's internally, maybe you can't collect data on an event that you hold at the local like science night, the volunteers that you have from your department, that could be a selling pitch for recruitment for undergraduates and graduate students if you show just how much participation impacted their commitment to the major. And that could be a pitch to your chair. And the same if you're a graduate student or a postdoc doing this work, just collecting information from the other graduate students and postdocs or undergraduates can be a real selling point of just like morale, like a morale booster, even if you can't see the impact it made on the public. Sometimes just engaging with folks in, a, in an environment where you get to talk about the, the advocacy or policy side can be really engaging for folks. So that's another form of, of data that you can collect. Um, yeah, thank you for bringing that point up. That that is uh, a good another another benefit and area to to consider. Um, I want to voice another question from um, from the Q and A panel. Um, and so we've talked about a lot of different ways to find engagement opportunities. So libraries, science camps, um, your university, etc. Um, and there's a question in the chat about um, have does anybody have any advice for using social media um, for science outreach and engagement? Um, so I'm wondering if anybody has any um, experience or or advice uh, for for the social media um, realm that we all, we all, we all engage with now. I could start, or Eva, do you want to start? Go ahead. Oh, I have, I don't have extensive experience, but I can tell you from maybe trying to, trying to advertise, well, trying to communicate scientific content. We oftentimes go into the trouble of trying to be very rigorous, which makes the statement lengthy. Um, so I've noticed out of all the social media that I've, I've uh, operated that Twitter and Instagram are the most successful ones because of just one sentence uh, and a picture kind of thing. Um, and it seems like, you know, it's, it's, you need a hook to catch people's interest. Um, and then they, they'll reach out and they'll look for more information. I mean, you can have, I'll just say, these are the ones that where I feel we're communicating the most information, even though it's with the least amount of words. Of words. Um, but definitely people see something and then contact um, more than, you know, posting a lengthy article on Facebook or LinkedIn or definitely LinkedIn is the most professional one if you, we can call it social media, but um, I would say just for, for engaging a diverse um, set of people, I've been happy with Twitter and Instagram. I'll jump in on that as well. Um, in my experience, doing outreach and engagement on social media is like its own full-time thing. Um, you have to be very dedicated in growing your own set of followers um, and, and reaching out to people. You still have to make all the same connections that you would have to make um, at institutions and stuff like that, because to do engagement on social media successfully, you need to have a network of people that are seeing your posts. Um, and growing that, like I said, is, is almost its own full-time job. Um, a lot of, a lot of people run the risk of like following and, and sharing information with like just people that they know and their friends on social media. And you get a lot of almost echo chambery kind of things that like your information is not getting out to the public it's getting out to the 100 people that happen to follow you um that you met in various places around conferences and stuff um so if if that is something you're interested in it does take dedication i myself am not uh, super comfortable on social media. Like it's just not something that I participate in very often. I get my news there sometimes. And then I kind of, I lurk, I lurk a lot. Um, it's definitely a great place for information when you know who to follow. And I think that some great links have been posted in the chat, um, 
physics girl is wonderful. I love her videos. There's also uh, Steve Mould, uh, who does excellent physics demonstrations on the internet. Um, but is something that feels like it takes a lot of buy-in up front. Um, and so as long as you're aware of that, it's great. But the other thing is, if you can get a job managing social media for a larger institution, um, that is also an outlet. Uh, if you really like being on social media, that has its own set of dedicated followers. People will look for, um, you know, the Kavli Institute to tweet stuff um, and that kind of thing that you'll, you'll be able to see what's outside of your, your social media network sphere. Yeah, I will add that. So using social media, it's great in many ways for professional development, even if it's just sharing your research. Like it has been shown, like there's there's data that shows that those who promote their research on social media, which normally tends to be LinkedIn and Twitter for academics mostly, uh, that they get more um, citations than others who might not necessarily use those social media, but also, yes, it takes a lot of dedication, but there are many people who are being lucky enough that started doing social media um, kind of early on in their careers, in their grad schools, and then have gained enough popularity that nowadays are um, science influencers and you know yeah science girl is one of like big physics girls one of the biggest names but there are other uh, people out there that might not be as recognized but like that's their whole career nowadays and they're doing pretty well but yes a lot of institutions also are asking and looking for people to do their um, social media like APS has um, a dedicated person doing social media from I think from a like a scientist perspective too, Dena demonstrated this, like the article that she that she and her colleagues present that published in physics uh, review, physics education research, they wrote more of a, a, a more general public piece. And that's what she shared in the chat. So even if you're publishing something, there's a you could probably work with your communications office to get whether it's an op-ed piece or an opinion piece, and those are much shorter but you can see most, most folks, like that's how I, I'm a qualitative researcher. So I can't, I can't get anything in social media because I'm like, this needs to be engaged and thought about and discussed. So I don't do social media, but I have done op-ed pieces so I can share that on my like Twitter account or LinkedIn account. And that can also engage the public in a way that I'm never gonna be savvy enough to get followers. So I leave that to, to Physics Girl and um, Shonda Prescott-Weinstein who does an amazing um, Twitter feed. So that's how like the, like someone like me who might not be as, as good at that, that's how I can engage with the public um, via social media through those op-ed pieces. And our communications department um, really helps with the development of that. Thanks everybody for your perspectives. It's good to hear kind of the different experiences and ways that we can use social media and engage. Um, I also dropped a link in the chat. Uh, the Institute of Physics has developed um, some guidelines or helpful resources for um, using, pr promoting physics on social media. So I would definitely check that out as well. Um, and I want to maybe in our the, the next um, bit of time we have here. Um, talk about, so we've talked a lot about how to find opportunities and different ways to engage. But once you're once you're engaging, once you have identified an opportunity, um, you know, we also want to make sure we're connecting with our audience and connecting with the people um, that we're trying to engage with. Um, and so I wonder uh, if any of the panelists would like to, to speak to um, how they try to make sure that the, their engagement work is relevant um, to the community that they are interacting with. Um, and if, if people have any tips for that um, to make sure that what you're doing is relevant.
I can share a little bit about, about my experience. Um, so I think uh, most of the public engagement, when they start, they probably like either have a specific audience category or group or demographics in mind, or sometimes people just started without thinking about that. So I would think that, I always think that having something in mind, even if it's like broad, just knowing what your goal is for the demographics and also for your audience to do. Do you want them to learn things? Do you want them to interact with you? Do you want to get engaged in a specific way? Or do you just want them to hang out? Um, so knowing, um, or do you want them to come back even? Like, do you want them to be like a one-time visitor of your event or do you want them to come back? So thinking about all of these, when, if you're starting a new program or while you're doing it, and uh, if you are doing any sort of assessment, meaning like surveys or even casual ways of like learning about your audience, um, for example, sometimes might share during an event with you. Yeah, this is my 10th time coming to this activity or event. Um, actually use those as a self-reflection or self-feedback for your own program to make improvements on your performance, on your how your program is functioning. And I would say the key part is communication. Just communicate with your audience, ask them what they want. Just don't assume that what you want for that program or for that audience is going to be the same as what they want and basically align more or less your goals with for them with the goals they have in mind for your program so i think one of the things that would matter a lot in having an audience which is engaged and has the same is on the same page as you is learning about them learning from them and understanding the needs they have specifically so this is one piece i've been like um learning uh talking with different programs over the years uh, that sometimes they get lost simply because they just don't know what the audience want and uh, like we had suggested for example doing bring a researcher on do some site visits during their event learn about how the audience is engaging with you or like talk with them do short interviews with them ask them questions so I think also sometimes some of the programs do surveys and just archive them as the administrative data that they need to do for the department or for their institution, but use those um, to actually make improvements as you go based on the responses that you receive for, from your audience. Yeah, and I think Denna had a really good example on her slides of a really short survey that you can give with with like one open-ended question that can get get at some of those pieces of what would make it um, relevant to your audience. And I think the issue is like part of the spark of why folks want to engage with the public is because they want to share their love of the science and just realize that like the reason why you got into it might not be what gets other folks into it. So like to reiterate what Dennis said, the more you can communicate with your audience and get them engaged. So lectures, you can see and like watch, you can see folks falling asleep. You can see folks on their phone, especially with like public en like engagement pieces. Um, so definitely talk to folks. And if there is someone that is the like gatekeeper for you or the person that's engaged. So at the Mag Lab, there's like my, my group and the public affairs department, ask them for advice. One of the constant mistakes that I see our scientists do is say that they can do it without any advice from anyone that has done it before and they go in and, and so take that advice and ask for it from folks who have done that work. If you know that there's a really strong communicator at your institution or even on social media, contacting them and asking them about those pieces and the constant feedback from your audience. And I would say in particular, this is really, really important if you're talking to folks who are different than you. So if you want to work with, if you are very passionate about working with people of color or folks from um, rural areas or low income, and you don't have that background, really talk to folks and understand it and work through an organization that has the trust and buy-in from those folks. And that's not to say that I, as a white woman, can't go into these spaces, but I really need to understand how I am perceived and what that engagement will look like in those spaces. So definitely, um, and the more you are authentic about like wanting that feedback and asking like, is this the right approach? How like, 
who should be involved in this, the more you will be trusted. So it's oh, it's it's awesome if you want to engage with those with folks that don't look like you and work on DEI, but definitely talk to experts um, before like just you know busting into those those spaces um, just to have some some humility too in terms of what you want to do. Yeah, I, I wanted to to definitely echo that last point about being genuine, because I think there is nothing like somebody coming there, coming to give a talk or do an engagement and not get presenting. And then you're thinking, <laughs> what gives this person the right to lecture me, right? Um, because we keep talking about empathy, but empathy is, this is a words that gain so much attention in the past. I think sometimes words get popular, but like empathy is really something very difficult, right? If you think about it, if we, for, for us to, to really see the world through somebody else's eyes, that's likely the, the ideal, but the impossible ideal, but instead you can build the trust and you can just trust people to tell you what their real experience is you can share yours, but be very honest about what you are and who you are and what you're not. And I think with science, oftentimes it has happened that way that when, when we tell our stories and they sound also successful and um, people can think, oh, but this will never be me. So it's important to say, hey, you know, this could, ha this happened to somebody like me. So, it's it just show it's possible, not that it's the standard necessarily, it's just kind of emphasize the fact that your unique story is an example of something that is possible versus saying, oh yeah, you know, you gotta follow these exact steps to, to do what I did and, and things like that. Um, and then the second thing I want to say on the practical side of things is that it seems to be very useful to, um, to, to think of ways for asynchronous communication. Because you know, we've all sat in, in uh, lectures where it's exciting, but overwhelming. And there is this like, I don't know, 10 minutes, what feels like 30 seconds for questions. And you can't digest what you just heard right away. And you really need to think about something to have an actually meaningful question. And then it's good to, okay, be able to contact somebody. Email though is a little bit formal. So I thought it, in the past few years, it has been very useful that we started having all these Slack channels. And I think that's kind of a, the, the, the whole idea of having a forum where you can really, you know, it's, it's, you can post your question on your own time, but also you can see what other people post. You actually need the other attendees that way. And you kind of like immediately find like-minded people or so, so it's, but it's on your own time and, and you can have, and sometimes you can just by reading what other people ask, you can remind yourself of, of what did you hear and formulate your own opinion on something or maybe you know, formulate your question that you couldn't find the right words. So I thought this sort of always think of a asynchronous form of communication to uh, a company, whatever you're trying to do has been very powerful at least in my experience. Uh, I love that idea of a, um, that is a great, great point. And um, I will plus one our Slack channel to continue questions from today. If you also are one that um, needs to process a little bit about what you heard and then follow up, we'll, I'll repost that link at the end here. Um, I wonder, uh, Chelsea, if you have any thoughts on, on this question of, of kind of understanding your audience and, and making sure you're connecting with your audience, especially given your background um, and your experience with museum studies. Yeah, um, one of the things that I have come across a lot in, in some of the things that I've done is thinking about how like, um, particularly if you're presenting your own research, sometimes when you're trying to engage others, you kind of have to step outside yourself and, and think about how this isn't necessarily for you. You are not your audience. Um, so getting in somebody else's head and thinking about what makes your research interesting to somebody else is very important. Um, but also thinking about like how this might relate to somebody else's life. Um, if I'm talking about um, doing nuclear research, I don't necessarily want to get into like the ins and outs of how a 
how a neutron is composed of quarks that might not be interesting to people but what what will be interesting is the facilities that we work in curious um and 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 how all of that kind of stuff like th these are things that they never get to see so it's going behind the scenes and seeing stuff that they may have seen in popular media like chernobyl uh was a big popular thing a couple years ago and i know that I, I ended up talking to a lot of people about like, what do you do at a nuclear facility? And I'm like, it's just just like they did on the show. Um, and, and all of that kind of stuff, thinking about how you can tie into um, little secrets about things, but also like maybe choosing like the most mundane thing about your research. So talking about plasma, you might wanna talk to people about their microwave and like have you ever stopped to think about like what happens when you put things in the microwave particularly like weird things like grapes um <laughs> uh and and that kind of stuff can also be really engaging and folks can do it at home sometimes safely sometimes a little bit less safely particularly with microwaves um but having something that folks can do like tabletop bar physics one of my favorites is um when you spin a coin on the table and it uh, on its side, as it spins, it slows down and it starts to wobble. And the sound that it makes as it falls flat on the table and stops spinning is the same type of sound um, that LIGO is looking for in gravitational waves. So you can spin a coin on a table and say like, it's the same physics of something that's rotating, but energy is being sucked out of it because of the interactions that it's experiencing. It's the same physics, on this tabletop here with this quarter as it is with giant black holes out in space. Um, so finding ways that people can take it with them and like show other people is also really cool and really powerful. I love those ideas. Um, that sounds like a great way. I, I have never heard of that um, way to ex explain um, LIGO and what LIGO is doing. That is awesome. I'm gonna use that in the future. <laughs> Um, all right, so we only have uh, about a few minutes left, um, and so I think we're going to wrap up here, but I want um, to take a moment to thank all of our panelists today for sharing their experiences and their advice. Um, if you all have um, any uh, follow-up questions that you think about, again, you can join the public engagement Slack space, or you can also send an email to um, webinars at APS.org. I just chatted that email address and we'll be sure to um, direct your question to our speakers today or if we can answer it here at APS, we will we will answer it. Um, so please, um, if you do have follow up questions, be sure to reach out. Um, I also wanted to remind you to take a moment to fill out the feedback survey that will land in your inbox soon um, from from Zoom. And also, we will be making um, a recording of today's webinar available on APS um, dot org slash webinars, uh, and you will also be notified when that becomes available. Um, just allow a few business days for us to process that and get that uploaded, um, and we will be sure to um, to have that uh, for you all and notify you all of that. Um, so with that, thank you to our speakers again, and everybody have a great um, rest of your 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 day. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.